program be looking at prayer for Malawi and China and looking at aspects of prayer and considering the subject of revival. I'm going to start with a prayer request from dear Bishop Edison Fiery, uh, who's going to a crusade very shortly uh, in Malawi. And he writes, My brother, I greet you in the name of Jesus Christ. I am currently writing to you to say thank you very much for all the words of encouragement and the word of God that you sent me. Indeed, God is using you to do good and in spreading his word. I will be having a big service starting from the 18th of December to the 1st of January in Atari village. This service will be more about breaking all the chains that the devil has put on people, chasing out the demons, delivering people, and I am asking you to put us in your prayers, since this is the time of difficulties in my church. We currently got robbed. They took our tent. I can see that my faith is being shaken day by day as I am in this journey of saving lives. Let us join hands and join God's army in fighting against evil spirits. In situations like this, I feel that the only way to the light is prayer. So I ask you again, please include us in your prayers that God may be with us from the beginning of the service to the end. We always base on the word of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and the, the third verse. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Here, Bishop Edison Theory, dear, dear man, who works in South Africa to earn money, to go back to Malawi, the country of his birth, and take from time to time to be able to take crusades in that church which, which he has helped to, to build. O oh God, Father, Thy servant, Edis, Bishop Edison Theory, is a man who has given his all to the gospel, for the gospel to be made known in Malawi. And as this crusade is starting at Atari Village on the 18th and going right through and including the 1st of January, May the gospel be preached in the power of the Holy Ghost. And that these demons which have come against that work, that they will be scattered, driven out. In fact, I command them to be out through all the authority in the Lord Jesus Christ that wherever they attack this work of Edison theory in this crusade, that they will be thwarted. And that it will be a mighty move of the Holy Ghost in every one of those services. That souls will be convicted 
of sins. And that wherever there is interference through witch doctors, that these witch doctors will be reduced to nothing. Because you are the Almighty God. And whoever comes and, and looks to interfere in the preaching of the gospel, that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ will destroy every satanic scheme and that there will be a great gathering of souls from these services who will turn to the living God, repent of their sins, so convicted will they be of their sins. And that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, thy beloved Son, will cleanse repentant sinners from all sin and all stain. And that from that very moment, as they come into the kingdom of God, that they will hunger and thirst after thyself and go on day by day to grow into the fullness of God in Jesus Christ, through whose name this is asked, the you, O Father, shall be glorified in the Son. Amen. Received the other day the latest edition of the magazine from Hudson Taylor Ministries, of which I'm so grateful that I receive these from different places. Some wonderful, wonderful reports. Some things are of the past, way, way of the past, and others are current. I'm going to start with, with one which is very well, long time ago. So let's point first, first of all to this vast, vast country of, of China with its teeming millions still, in fact millions, millions there, who still to hear the gospel. Now this is called Reflection from the life of Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor, the missionary who went out to China, and it cost him, it cost him everything. And this is showing what, it, what the cost was to leave his mother behind and go on that first journey. Hudson Taylor departed on his first journey to China on Monday, September 19th, 1853, at the age of 21. He and his loved ones faced the reality of having to say a painful goodbye. We cannot imagine what was going through the mind and heart of his dear mother, who did not expect to ever see her son again. She wrote about this time of goodbye. Seeing me in tears, he said, O oh, mother, do not grieve. I am so happy. I cannot. I'll tell you what I think is the difference between us. You dwell on the parting. I look to the meeting, alluding to their reunion in the better land. His mother continues, before retiring for the night, he read aloud part of the 14th chapter of John. Let not your heart be troubled, and engaged in prayer. The throne of grace was, an, was easy of access, and while offering thanks for mercies received, and imploring continued blessings for himself, for those he was leaving, for the church and for the world yet lying in the arms of the wicked one, it was evident 
that to him this was no strange work. Hudson Taylor was also right about these last moments with his dear mother. Never shall I forget that day, nor how she went with me into the cabin that was to be my home for nearly six long months. With a mother's loving hand, she smoothed the little bed. She sat by my side and joined in the last hymn. We should sing together before parting. We knelt down and she prayed. The last mother's prayer I was ever to hear before leaving for China. Then notice was given that we must separate, and we had to say goodbye, never expecting to meet on earth again. For my sake she restrained her feelings as much as possible. We parted, and she went ashore giving me her blessing. I stood alone on deck, and she followed the ship as we moved toward the dock gates. As we passed through the gates, and the separation really commenced, never shall I forget the cry of anguish wrought from my mother's heart. It went through me like a knife. I never knew so fully until then what God, what God so loved the world meant. And I am quite sure my precious mother learned more of the love of God for the perishing in that one hour than in all her life before. So there, the dear, dear mother saw that ship leaving the docks of Liverpool to take her son to China and he was to have a great, great impact in China. And it does cost because here was Hudson Taylor taking hold of the scripture, Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So there he was presenting his body to be the body of the Holy Ghost to go out there to those vast, vast numbers in China, lost souls, and to take that wonderful and glorious message of salvation. Now to bring us up to date, I picked up a report in the British Church newspaper. And it's Brethren Pray For Us, Persecution of Church in China to Escalate, as Zihi Jiang experiment goes national. So let's see what we can make of this. In October 2012, the South China Morning Post ran a series of articles on China's looming leadership transition. It said, for clues about how China's leader in waiting, Xi Jinping, might manage the world's second largest economy. Xi Jiang province is a good place to start looking. After explaining that the years Xi spent in Xiangjiang 2002-2007 as party secretary and as governor are regarded as a transformative period during which Xi Jiang expanded its private sector and moved toward cleaner, more innovative industries. The author surmises that as President of the People's Republic, Xi Jinping would doubtless work the same on a national level. Xi has been purging dissident, that 
primarily through an anti-corruption campaign, escalating repression, increasing censorship, and tightening the reins on civil society. In the spirit of Lenin and Mao, Zai maintains that all elements of society should serve socialism and be consistent with Marxist-Leninist thinking, pos positing communism as an attainable goal. Zai has revived Chairman Mao dictum about the party's tight control over culture, particularly creative arts, literature and religion. The reality is that Xi Jiang is nothing other than China's Christian heartland. Xi Jiang's business hub, Wenzhou, a city of some 10 million, is believed to have the largest Christian population of any city in China. In its battle against the church, in Xi Jiang, the Communist Party has forcibly removed some 1,800 crosses, much to the distress of faithful believers, for whom the cross is the ultimate symbol of grace, salvation, transformation and hope, not only for the individual, but for the, na the nation. Dissenting churches have been demolished, and protesting church members have been beaten and arrested. On July 1, 2015, the Chinese Communist Party enacted a national security law that paved the way for increased national repression and persecution, purportedly in defense of national security. Then in the massive crackdown, commencing on the weekend of July 11 and 12, 2015, Chinese Communist Party arrested some 300 prominent human rights activists and lawyers, including several who were defending religious cases, in particular cases from Xi Jiang. By this time a lawyer, Zhang Kai, was advising congregations on their constitutional rights despite having been temporarily detained on July 10th, 2015, during which time he was interrogated and warned not to get involved. Zhang persisted in providing legal advice to more than 100 churches. On July 14th, 2015, in the midst of the crackdown, Zhang announced the formation of lawyers for protection of the cross. A group of some 30 Christian lawyers from across the country who would take on the Zijiang churches, church cases. Zhang Kai was arrested on the night of August 25th, 2015 and was disappeared into China's secretive and notorious black jail system accused of inciting disorder and spreading fiction. Also criticizing Chinese Communist Party policy in Zijiang was Pastor Gu Yu Yi's senior pastor of China's largest Chinese Communist Party approved and registered Three Self Patriotic Movement Church. The 10,000 strong Zhongji church in the Zijiang capital, Hang Zuhu, hoping to protect themselves from negative consequences, the Free Self Patriotic Movement and Associated China Christian Council cut Ju loose, officially dismissing him. Uh, on eight, January 18th, Pastor Ju was arrested on January 27th 
and disappeared into China's black jail system on charges pertaining to corruption. By early February 2016, eight influential Free Self, Patriotic Movement and China Christian Council leaders had been arrested and were being held in communicado. On September 8, the Chinese government released a del deliberative draft of its new regulations on religious affairs. The regulations gave the Chinese Communist Party total control over religion, unregistered and unapproved religious activity will no longer be tolerated. Registered churches will be obliged to follow strict guidelines and all building will be tightly regulated. Not only has the Chinese Communist Party set the stage for a flood of persecutions and prosecutions against the church, but it is also poised to tighten the noose around China's human rights lawyers. When Zhang was arrested in August 2015, he was held in solitary confinement and in darkness for six months until February 25th, when under extreme duress he made a television confession in which he repented of his crimes, retracted his criticisms of the Chinese Communist Party and advised other lawyers against getting involved. Upon his release on March 23rd, Zhang returned to his mother's home in Inner Mongolia, subject to strict bail conditions that he stay out of politics and refrain from speaking to the media in Inner Mongolia, subject to strict bail conditions that he stay out of politics and refrain, yes, refrain. In late August, Zhang posted a video on WeChat in which he retracts his former statement, which he explains was made under duress after experiencing a six-month detention that was all black and no daylight. On August 31st, security police from Wenzhou city surrounded Zhang's mother's inner Mongolia home and took him away. His condition and whereabouts remain unknown. The Zhang experiment is about to go national and this apparently was uh, originated from Morning Star News. Heavenly Father, it's seen that the great cost to Hudson Taylor with that parting from his mother to go to China that reaching out that he started in China and that many received the gospel message. And in the midst of increased persecution present day where man has the, he's doing his worst against the Christians in China. God has done his best. Oh God, you did your best. When you spared not your son, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And you've given your only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him in China shall be saved. Even the persecutors, may they hear through thy direct intervention 
whether by vision or by dream. And that thy word can be placed into their hands. That through the darkness of Satan, the light, the glorious light of God in Jesus Christ will shine. And that for these dear, dear ones, like Zang, who have suffered so much, been shut up in darkness for six months. Now he has disappeared, but you know where he is. And nothing, no nothing, shall separate him or any of these others from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And that in the midst of this tribulation, the church will, not, will be filled with the Holy Ghost, with the Holy Ghost and power, that where man says no, that God, you will say yes. And that through the tribulation, instead of a decrease, there shall be a mighty increase in those who come to the Lord Jesus Christ to repent of their sins, to receive of the cleansing of his precious blood, and that there will be sons of God who are so on fire with the Holy Ghost that nothing, no nothing, shall prevent a glorious move of the Holy Ghost throughout every part of China and a mighty gathering in of souls who at present are lost and hell-bound. For this is asked in the name, Father, that you cannot deny. Show that you are God in China for thy glory and thy glory alone it is asked. Amen. I'm going to make a start on a, a call to prayer by J.C. Ryle, who, who became the first bishop of First Anglican Bishop of Liverpool. And I've taken this from the Interceders, put together by Alec Dunn, who I was speaking to uh, earlier in the week. Acts chapter 12 and the fifth verse. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison. But prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. J.C. Ryle says, I have a question to offer you. It is contained in three words. Do you pray? The question is one that none but you can answer. Whether you attend public worship or not, your minister knows. Whether you have family prayers in your house or not, your relations know. But whether you pray in private or not, it is a matter between yourself and God. I beseech you in all affection to attend to the subject I bring before you. Do not say that my question is too close. If your heart is right in the sight of God, there is nothing in it to make you afraid. Do not turn off my question by replying that you say your prayers. It is one thing to say your prayers and another to pray. Do not tell me that your question is unnecessary. 
listen to me for a few minutes and I will show you good reasons for asking it. I ask whether you pray because prayer is absolutely needful to a man's salvation. I say absolutely needful and I say so advisedly. I am not speaking now of infants or idiots. I am not settling the state of the heathen. I know that where little is given, there is little will be required. I speak especially of those who call themselves Christians in a land like our own. And of such I say, no man or woman can expect to be saved who does not pray. I hold salvation by grace as strongly as anyone. I will gladly offer a free and full pardon to the greatest sinner that ever lived. I would not hesitate to stand by his dying bed and say, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ even now, and you shall be saved. But that a man can have salvation without asking for it, I cannot see in the Bible that a man will receive pardon of his sins, who will not so much as lift up his heart inwardly and say, Lord Jesus, give it to me. This I cannot find. I can find that nobody will be saved by his prayers, but I cannot find that without prayer anybody will be saved. It is not absolutely needful to salvation that a man should read the Bible. A man may have no learning or be blind and yet have Christ in his heart. It is not absolutely needful that a man should hear public preaching of the gospel. He may live where the gospel is not preached or he may be bedridden or deaf. But the same thing cannot be said about prayer. It is absolutely needful to salvation that a man should pray. There is no royal road either to health or learning. Princes and kings, poor men and peasants, all alike must attend to the wants of their own bodies and their own minds. No man can eat, drink or sleep by proxy. No man can get the alphabet learned for him by another. All things which everybody must do for himself or they will not be done at all. Just as, as it is with the mind and body, so it is with the soul. There are certain things absolutely needful to the soul's health and well-being. Each must attend to these things for himself. Each must repent for himself. Each must apply to Christ for himself. And for himself each must speak to God and pray. You must do it for yourself, for nobody else can do it. To be prayerless is to be without God, without Christ, without grace, without hope and without heaven. It is to be on the road to hell. Now can you wonder that I ask the question, do you pray? I ask again whether you pray, because a habit of prayer is one of the surest marks of a true Christian. That will be continued in future programs. And you looked now at, at Revival. The book by Hugh Black that I've been using now for quite some weeks, published by New Dome Books of Greenock in Scotland. And we've been working through the chapter Matters Related to Revival got up to the 
sub section God and our vocal cords. There is another matter related to Wesley and the early Methodists that people reading might hardly believe. People used to ring the church bells to silence these preachers. You say, look, that's a bit of nonsense. You don't need to have a great cacophony of sound to silence solitary preachers. Indeed, with some of the preachers who are wandering around these days, you sure don't. But I tell you, if you get a Holy Ghost preacher, that can be quite another matter. You say, what do you mean by that? I mean that the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the mighty God, can come upon an anointed servant. That local vocal cords are changed. I have experienced it hundreds of times in open-air meetings when the voice became like the sound of a trumpet and could be heard for a great distance. The anointing of God used to fall upon us. I remember one night when communists disputed our preaching pitch. He had arrived before our time of gathering on a Sunday night. There they were rigged up with a loudspeaker blasting away. I suggested that we could share the time on the site. Oh no, their spokesman said, it's all right. We don't mind you going on as well. Just you go ahead as well. It was fine for him. He had the loudspeaker and we hadn't. We said, all right. So we took our stance about 10 or 15 yards away, certainly not too far, and began. The anointing came, certainly not too far, and began. The anointing and the power came, the volume came, and the communist audience came. The crowd gathered around us, and the opposition packed up what they then seemed trumpetry equipment and went home. It happens right now in, the, in these days. I totally understand the ringing of the church bells in Wesley's day. And I have no doubt that the preachers won the battle. You have no idea of the miracle that God can work. In my own experience, one of the most amazing instances of this kind was at the funeral of the late Mr. Robert Galt. My voice had been strained and was badly defective. It was an open-air service and a great number had gathered. I had a living word in my heart but no voice to proclaim it. Just at that time, I was writing a book in which I had been referring to David Wilkerson and the miracle that happened one night when the gangs were gathered and Wilkerson came to the end of his tether. God can be very disconcerting at times. It was as though he said to me, What, about, what do you know now? You need a miracle. You need a miracle now. You know, by the grace of God, I agreed. I opened myself to God. I believed God, and he worked a miracle. My voice became as the voice of a trumpet sounding across that whole crowd of people. God was there in power. I think Satan did not want God's hon honoured servant to have the kind, that kind of victorious funeral. But God loved his servant, who had been a man of God. And God, I believe, was minded 
that the voice of triumph would sound. God attends to these details in life. He is interested and concerned about all that kind of thing. Ours is a miracle-working God. Then, subtitle, A Glorious Ending. The time of Wesley's departure drew near. He had been an organiser, and his, his societies were growing all over the world. They grew into the Methodist movement. Whitfield, on reviewing his own work, could say, I built with a rope of sand. I think in the sense of failing to organise his converts, as Wesley had done. Towards the end, Wesley uttered his ever-memorable ever words, The best of all is, God is with us. I occasionally look back over the years and review our own situation. I remember the early days when there was only a handful of us. I remember the moving of God, the acquiring of her, our first church, the revelation, the vision, the provision of the funds, the move, moving out into other areas, the building of other churches. I remember the actions of God. And you know, it is often easy to look backward and say, these were great days, and fail to appreciate present blessing. I do not believe in overindulging in that way of thinking. I believe we are now having perhaps the best times we have ever had. I believe the presence of the living God is intensifying in our midst. And I believe if I was departing tonight, I would remember Wesley's words and bless God's name, that he is with us now. Ours is not a man-made movement, not just a strong leadership movement, but a movement of the Spirit of God, expressing Christ through the lives of those who have become deeply committed Christians. The best of all is God is with us. Wesley glanced backward, but he gazed forward. Do it that way. Glance backward for encouragement, but gaze forward to the vision of the glory for motivation. Christ, like Moses, endured the seeing him who was invisible, and for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising shame, and hath sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. It ends that particular chapter, so the next one, we're looking at a completely uh, a revival here, the Welsh Revival of 1904. And Hugh Black says, I am moving on past the Great Awakening of 1859. Yes, that undoubtedly was a Great Awakening, and particularly uh, over in Ireland, in, in Ulster, I read some amazing instances of how God moved in 1859. Although it had profound results in this country, I am not minded to go into this at present, but to come up quickly to the Welsh Revive of 1904. Wales was in a very bad condition. Even if, if not as morally low as it was in it was England in Wesley's day. In Wesley's day, the churches were cold and formal. In Wales, at the beginning of the twentieth century, they were moder modernistic, having been badly affected by liberal theology. And as so often happens. 
God put his hand on a man. Revival often starts with God putting his hand on a man or a woman or a small group, drawing them into a place of deep intimacy and union with himself. After they are affected, there is a move outward. The most holy, not the least holy, are the first convicted. In Wales, God put his hand on a young man, Evan Roberts. For about six months, he took that young man more or less into heaven for four hours every night, from one o'clock to five o'clock in the morning. He was out of the body in the presence of God. He was being tuned. He was being prepared for what was to come. Then, in God's time, he began to preach. Four principles. There were four distinctive things that Evan Roberts brought to his audiences. He looked for immediate action and he felt that God had in vision promised him a hundred thousand souls. I want to bring to you these four things. Before presenting them, he asked the question of everyone present in his meetings. Do you desire an outpouring of the Spirit? If yes, the four conditions must be met. We too shall face these four conditions and come to a place not merely of academic interest, but of positive action. 1. Is there any sin in your past that you have not confessed to God? On your knees at once, your past must be put away and yourself cleansed. Now I ask you that too. Are you carrying any known unconfessed sin? Then stop trif trifling with God. There is no future for you until sin is dealt with. Two, is there anything in your life that is doubtful? Have you forgiven everybody? Everybody, everybody, if not, don't expect forgiveness for your own sins. You won't get it. I ask that same question. Three, do what the Spirit prompts you to do. Obedience, prompt, implicit, unquestioning obedience to the Spirit. Do what God tells you. I... I warned you about the same, of the danger of the misapplication of finished teaching, digging like a terrier to find sins that are long forgiven. Don't do that, but whatever the Spirit indicates to you, do that. He makes no mistakes. If he brings up something that you have hidden for years, don't hide it any longer. Do it. Obey the Spirit, and you'll find release. And you may find that he will bring another thing before you, and another, and another. He will wipe the slate clean. Trust the Holy Spirit, but obey him implicitly. And four, a public confession of Christ as your Saviour. There is a vast difference between mere profession and a real confession. Church membership may be nothing more than mere profession. There should be open and true confession to a relationship with the living Lord. The reaping. They went down like corn before the reaper as the Holy Spirit swept large areas of Wales north and south. And oh, the power and the glory of it, the miners saved in masses, wrongs righted, deep sins forgiven, magistrates with no cases to judge, pubs emptied, football terraces emptied, 
various holes of iniquity emptied, and the voice of swearing no longer heard on many of the streets. Men were afraid to swear, so intense was the power. The journalists smelled the story, and they came and heard the voice of the living God, and were converted where they sat. The power of God was there, and souls came in masses. There was a loud pouring of glory, and Evan Roberts got his hundred thousand souls. Social consequences. Let us look for a moment at the outcome of the revival socially. The newspapers reported that since the commencement of the revival, there has been very few arrests for drunkenness. In Rose, a, a North Wales mining town, the justices of the peace were presented with white gloves, signifying that there were no cases for trial. The official police records show that in Glamorgan, in 19... there were 10,528 convictions for drunkenness. In 1906, these figures had decreased by almost half. As a result of this, there was a great improvement in moral standards. The public houses and the gambling dens now lay empty. Theatres closed and the terraces at football grounds were empty and desolate. As the hardened unbelievers were gloriously converted Confessions of awful sins were heard on every side. Bad debts for many years previously were paid back with interest. The revival affected the Welsh miners more than any of these men. They were transformed in an instant. They will be seen praying with each other. who lived in an old environment. So only being accustomed to commands with foul were now totally confused and almost stopped working until they became adjusted to the new kindness and clean language. Family situations were changed. Men now spent time with their children instead of drinking. Cruelty to children also decreased. And the numbers of prosecutions for child, for child cruelty fell to almost nothing in the county of Gormorgan. Finally, the streams and the influence of that revival went worldwide. Communication had become much easier in the 20th century than in earlier days. News of the Welsh revival flashed across the world and its influence went into many lands. What some of you don't know is that its influence is with us now. Our background sources, the springs from which our own fellowships come, are of two types and one of these is Welsh. A 1904 revival had a profound influence on the Jeffreys brothers. And it was George Jeffreys who brought a knowledge of Pentecost to Greenock. It was under his preaching that Miss Taylor, a founder of our movement, was convicted of sin. She was powerfully converted and there was always in her spirit a known affinity with that earlier movement in Wales. Through her, the influence of the Welsh revival is alive in many of your hearts, although you have not necessarily been aware of where the light stream came from, it is nevertheless one part of our heritage. O oh God, our Father, thank Thee that during this time we have been able to look and pray over the crusade coming 
in Malawi. And for her dear, dear brothers and sisters in China who are currently going through much testings in the fires of persecution. And to prayer, how vital it is to have that personal prayer life which shows that a soul has been fully converted. And now, as we just touched on, on revival, and seen what, you, what was done by the move of the Holy Ghost in that Welsh revival which started in 1904. O oh God, in thy mercy, there are billions yet of lost souls scattered all over the world in need of hearing the glorious gospel of redemption through your dear Son. Come down, O God, like in days past, and take the field, that man will be out of it, and thyself as almighty God will fulfill thine own purpose that every creature should be given the chance of being reconciled with thyself. For this is asked for thy glory through the Lord Jesus Christ who gave his own blood that repentant sinners could be forgiven. Amen.